Hello, everyone. Good evening or morning or night, depends on where you are located. My name is Liana Shvachi. I'm the EAT Health uh, DAH Regional Coordinator and also the Strategy Lead of the Clinician Engineer Hub. Both of these uh, communities are organizing some very interesting talks like this one from Matt Morgan, from Dr. Matt Morgan, that will talk about devices in intensive care units. So Dr. Matt Morgan uh, is an intensive care doctor and lead for critical care research for Wales. His open letter addressed to patients during the 2020 COVID pandemic has been read over uh, by, half, uh, by over half a million people worldwide and viewed by over two million times. His first book, Critical, that we have here with us as well, uh, has been translated into four languages that I just realized, I just got to know that it was Portuguese, Russian, and Chinese, and it's also in English. So it's amazing to try to read it in different languages. His articles have been featured in The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Daily Mail, The Sunday Mirror, and The Huffington, Huffington Post. A he is a regular writer of the internationally acclaimed British Medical Journal, and his article, A Letter from the ICU, is one of their most popular ever opinion article. So he has been also nominated for the 2020 Royal Society David Attenborough Prize. So please welcome Dr. Matt Morgan. Thanks for being with us, and the stage is yours. Right, well, hello, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining me on what is a nice Welsh evening here in Cardiff. My name is Dr. Matt Morgan. I work as an intensive care consultant in a big hospital in Cardiff. And I'm also passionate about public engagement of science, which is why I wrote uh, my first book, which was published uh, nearly two years ago called Critical, Science and Stories from the Brink of Life which guides you on a tour through the intensive care unit, meeting some of the most critically ill patients and explaining how science can sometimes, hopefully, help save their lives. Well, today I want to talk to you about some of that technology in intensive care, but rather than do it through a dry manner of slides all about the devices, I actually want to introduce you to the concept of biomimicry. In other words, learning from other non-human animal species about some novel ways of treating people when they are critically ill. So this is going to be a presentation. It's going to last uh, around 30 minutes or so. It's hopefully also going to be the topic of uh, a new book, which will be out in October 2021, called How a Kiss and a Frog Can Save Your Life. And you can follow me in that journey of researching that uh, by following me on Twitter, which will be on the first slide. If you've got questions as this goes on, uh, please type them in the box, let me know, and at the end of this, uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer some of those questions. So let me just go ahead and share the screen for this talk. I hope you're sitting comfortably and that you have a drink with you. Okay, so how kissing a frog can save your life and that's my Twitter address underneath. Well this all started really uh, when my daughter was young she used to love me reading her nursery rhymes and being someone who's interested in, in history and the primary sources of things I actually ordered an original copy of the Brothers Grimm. So this is where lots of uh, the best known fairy tales actually originated from uh, this book back in the 17 and 1800s, you know, a lot of the Disney films. And one of her particular favorite songs was The Princess and the Frog. So one particular night when I was reading my daughter a bedtime story, I decided to read from the original. And it's a bit different than the Disney version, let me tell you that. Uh, so it says, the princess pricked up the frog with her two fingers, carried him upstairs into her room, lay down on the bed, looked at the frog and said, you are a disgusting creature. I hate you. 
she picked up the frog, threw the frog against the wall, and the frog was dead. Now, if I've got one piece of advice, it's probably that's not the greatest story to read your daughter if you're hoping that she will sleep after that. But this is the original story of the princess and the frog. And in fact, this is going to guide us on our journey through biomimicry or how learning about non-human animal species can impact on science and technology. But I'm going to teach you instead about somebody else who was thrown against the wall and also didn't get up where his family feared he was dead. And this was a patient who I met called Nathan, who you can see here in beautiful 3D rendered detail. He was an amateur boxer who was in one of his first amateur boxing fights, was hit in the face, thrown against the uh, side bars of the boxing ring, much like the frog, and didn't get up from the floor. And it was clear when we looked at Nathan's scans, and as you can see here, he actually resulted in having a po portion of his bone off his head to treat this. But when we first saw the scans, it was clear that Nathan was very ill. And I want him to take us on a journey of learning how different animals can teach us about the human body. Now, this isn't new. This is a cave painting from the French Lassau caves. Uh, back you know thousands and thousands of years ago into our prehistoric past and it shows a picture of what was probably a woolly mammoth at the time and what's fascinating about this is a few things firstly the people who lived in that region very rarely ate woolly mammoth and but it was the kind of aspirational drawings that they made on their walls much like when we take a photo of a eggs benedict brunch and put it on instagram we don't really eat eggs benedict every day we probably have cereal or toast but what we show to the outside world is something aspirational about us much like uh, the case here with this woolly mammoth for example and another key important thing that you can see in this woolly mammoth is the fact that the heart is actually anatomically in the right position and amazingly it's actually anatomically the right size so these people clearly had a knowledge of the animals around them and a knowledge of what was inside of those animals so today I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to take you on a journey all the way from uh, looking at how dogs can help critically ill people in the intensive care unit from 7 million years ago, all the way through to how the fish 22 million years ago can help us and going back further and further until eventually we find how kissing a frog or other lizards in this case can help save our lives. So let's get back to our patient. This is Nathan. This is a scan of Nathan's when he was critically ill in the intensive care unit. And we can see that an area of his brain is being pushed out to the side of his skull. He had a severe traumatic brain injury. And this is something that may well not be survivable. Now we know now how to treat people with this kind of injuries by increasing the blood pressure in the body to compensate for the higher pressure in the head but we've only known that for the last 50 years or so since some of this data has come out yet some creatures like this creature a Rothschild giraffe this was Misha from the Perth Zoo creatures like this have been doing the same thing as we do for patients with brain injuries for millions of years because they have a brain which is at the end of a two meter long pipe really high up so how on earth do these creatures get blood to that brain get blood to that head and how have we adapted that knowledge and applied it in clinical medicine through clinical engineering through knowledge of biomimicry to help patients well if first of all if you look at the blood pressure of land mammals it fits a nice balanced pattern however the giraffe is a complete outlier it's got a systolic blood pressure of over 225 millimeters of mercury, which is the highest blood pressure out of any land mammal. And the reason it has this, of course, is to get the blood to the top of the brain. And this is exactly the same as we did for Nathan. Because the pressure in the brain was so high, we increased his blood pressure through using drugs in order to achieve the same as the giraffe has been trying to tell us to do for millions of years. 
And yet we've only known that this is a good strategy to use in brain injury for the last 50 years or so. Furthermore, if you do a scan of a giraffe's heart, which is pretty difficult to do, you need a stepladder for a start, what you'll be able to see is the way it achieves this super high blood pressure. This scan is pretty hard to interpret, but you can see the left ventricle squeezing, and it's a very thick, thick left ventricle. In fact, if you look at a prosection specimen, that left ventricle there, if it were in a human, this human would be dead. You would think they would have died of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for example, in this case. But this is how a giraffe manages to achieve that amazing blood pressure. What we don't understand is how on earth the giraffe not have heart attacks. If this was in a human, blood couldn't get from the surface arteries all the way to that middle because the muscle is so thick. And this would be a severe critical illness in human. But in giraffes, for reasons we don't understand, because we probably haven't asked, they manage to survive. In fact, they manage to thrive. So we got Nathan through the first few days of his critical brain injury. We used the drugs, much like the giraffe, to increase his blood pressure. We did all the things that Misha, the Rothschild giraffe, does in normal everyday life. But Nathan was getting worse. And he was getting worse because his breathing was getting worse. And the reasons for this is Nathan actually had asthma and we struggled to ventilate his lungs correctly to get the amount of carbon monoxide out that we needed. And this too is a problem in giraffes. This person on the left hand side is a pretty inspirational doctor who worked uh, in and around South Wales actually, Dr Hugh Jones, whose passion in life was animal physiology. And this specimen was actually taken in London Zoo after a giraffe who was natu found naturally to have died. He used to actually do ward round in London Zoo, this guy. He was a pretty inspirational character. And he showed how a giraffe manages to breathe through a two metre long tiny plastic straw. In other words, it's trachea. And what does it do? Well, first of all, the diameter of the trachea is much narrower than you would expect in other mammals. So it adapts in that way. But it does exactly the same as we did for Nathan. It breathes very slowly and very deeply with very large tidal volumes. So this reduces the impact of the dead space from the trachea on every breath. And again, we've only known to do this really over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But the Rothschild giraffe has been doing this for millions of years. Now, I was called to the bedside one day after Nathan had got through this tough period with his brain injury and the nursing staff are very concerned because Nathan had a temperature. And of course, the first question you must always ask when a patient has a temperature is, are they a goat? And that's because goats normally have a body temperature which can be 39 or even 40 degrees Celsius. In this case, this is a picture of a very famous goat, uh, Shanklin IV, who is the uh, sergeant major of the Welsh regiment and the rugby mascot for the Welsh team, actually. And he's actually outranks anybody else in that regiment. Um, there's a historical story to that. that during the 1700s, in the Battle of Bunker Hill, a goat charged to the front of the Welsh regiment. And ever since, it was the highest ranking officer in that regiment. But a goat has a very high body temperature because it has to deal with a huge amount of fungal disease. And yet, in humans, we try to cool them down when they have high temperatures. Is this a good idea, especially for people with fungal disease? We don't know because we haven't asked. But anyway, Nathan did have a high body temperature and it was affecting his brain so much so we had to use this fancy device to cool him down. And this is a water-cooled circuit system where there's cool water perfused through pads which are applied to the skin and cool people down through this very effective surface cooling. It's quite a new machine. It costs a lot of money. Uh, it was invented you know, less than 20 years ago. People felt very clever for inventing it. But they hadn't, of course, met the hooping crane. Because if they had 
they would know that the whooping crane has been doing this for millions of years. In fact, if you get Hoopin Crane Monthly, which is probably one of my favourite journals uh, this year, you will have seen in this particular edition, probably my favourite edition, uh, that looking at a heat camera of the Hoopin Crane, it too has a water-cooled coaxial system for keeping its temperature down. In this case, it stands in cold water. The coaxial system through its leg cools down its blood exactly the same way as we were using with this fancy new device in Nathan. But Nathan had further challenges. He developed pretty bad diarrhea actually. And we can classify diarrhea. Bristol's famous for many things, maybe the Clifton Suspension Bridge and for other things, but it's also famous or infamous for the Bristol stool chart of how to describe feces. And in this case, Nathan had pretty bad diarrhea because he had C. difficile infection. This is an opportunist infection, often can happen after antibiotics, for example. And we were worried about this. We were worried it would cause inflammation of the bowel and how should we treat it? Well, in fact, I know what you're thinking now. Please, please, please send me a picture or video of a caterpillar doing a poo. Okay, here, just for you, is a caterpillar doing a poo. And caterpillars are pretty interesting because we know now in humans and other mammals, the bacteria in our bowel, known as the microbiome, is a really important mixture of organisms, which are some determinants of health. Yet the caterpillar has absolutely no microbiome and it's dependent only on the food it eats. And so that suggests we can change the microbiome according to the food you eat. And that's exactly what I thought about when I was here in Perth, in sunny Western Australia, where I spent a year doing a fellowship with my wife and my daughter. The seas were blue, the coffee was good, the pay was higher, but I really missed coming back to the UK. And I'm really glad I did come back to the UK and uh, all of the culture that we have here in Wales, for example. Um, this was uh, a particular highlight of my return trip. This is actually a photo done by a, a famous artist who uh, was documenting a night out in Cardiff city centre, obviously before COVID. But I returned to the UK, uh, but one thing that I did take away with me was this amazing guy called Professor Barry Marshall, who first described infections causing medical problems, such as H. pylori causing stomach ulcers. But he's also passionate about feces and about fecal transplants and how the use of fecal transplants may help treat diseases like C. difficile infection. And I think it's no surprise that this concept of fecal transplant came from Australia, uh, here, out of the office window, we could peer into Perth Zoo and see these beautiful, cute koalas. But in fact, koalas are very well known, as they're doing here, to eat their mum's feces as soon as they are born. And they do this for very good reason. They do this in order to gain the correct microbiome, the correct mixture of bugs in your intestine, exactly the same as faecal transplants are now doing to treat many diseases, including autoimmune disease and things like C. difficile. In fact, we know even being born with your face towards or away from the rectum, which will influence how much feces goes in a baby's mouth, can influence their subsequent risk of development of diseases like diabetes, Crohn's disease, asthma, and so on. So humans automatically in some ways have a fecal transplant at birth, but we could have learnt these facts if we'd only looked into the animal kingdom. Okay, so we got Nathan through his infection. He didn't need a fecal transplant. We used other antibiotics to treat it, but he was becoming iller and iller, this time because of a severe lung infection. And we thought we needed to use different ways to treat his breathing. And one of the ways we were going to treat not only his breathing, but he also had a very, very abnormal heart rate. 
look into other animals, the heart of this aluga whale, for example, is absolutely massive. And we can understand some of the ways that heart arrhythmias are produced and managed if we look at this very example. In fact, what's amazing about a whale's heart is the distance needed for electrical impulses to pass is absolutely huge. You know, in humans, it's a tiny amount that electrical impulses need to go from the atria to the ventricle. It takes 200 milliseconds. Yet in a whale, the amount of time it should take for these impulses to pass would be impossible. So how do they do it? Well, this was a question that a cardiac physiologist asked and wanted to get an ECG trace from a whale. Now, that's pretty hard to do. Uh, you know, the size of the heart alone is absolutely massive. But of course, whales live in extraordinary environments. And in order to find out what this gap is in the electrical transmission, so-called the PR interval, we really needed to get an ECG from the whale. Sadly, they arranged a boat trip all the way out to South America to do this, but they chose to do that during the mating season of the whales. And if you take nothing away from this presentation, I just want you to remember that a whale's penis is also known as a Pink Floyd. So it was really hard to get an ECG sample from whales because they were mating at this time. But they did just about manage to do so by using some suckers on the surface of the whales. And the tracing that they got was this, which amazingly shows that in fact the PR interval of a whale is just 400 milliseconds. In a human, 200 milliseconds. But in a whale, the distance is extraordinarily large and yet it's only 400 milliseconds. And so this actually puts the humpback whale on this flattened out level of PR intervals. And the question is, how does this work? What's the engineering, what's the electrical theory behind this? How can the distance be so great and yet the conduction time so small? And the answer is, we don't really know. So again, we need to investigate these things. We need to look at biomimicry. This is probably about the density of these fibers and probably about the way that impulse propagation happens through particularly dense fibers. And it's got huge implications for the treatment of people with heart arrhythmias, for example. And yet we don't know, we haven't looked. Okay, so back to Nathan. His oxygen levels were pretty low and we needed to use a machine that was this. This is called a high frequency oscillator machine. It breathes for you 300 times uh, a minute rather than the normal 12 times a minute. And it's a machine that's been around since the 1970s, nothing before that. And it has helped some people, although the evidence of its use in intensive care is difficult and disputed. But although this has only been around since the 1970s, I have a dog who's right next to me sleeping right now, and he could have told us this method of breathing millions of years ago, because it uses the same frequency as a dog pants and probably the same method of gas exchange as dogs use when they actually pant. So again, we need to look to animals to answer some of these questions. Yet Nathan got even more unwell. Not even that machine could help. And that's when we thought about the Bedouin spiny tail lizard. We like to think that intensive care patients are the only ones that have what we call positive pressure ventilation where we squeeze air into a machine or a bag into our lungs. And yet, if you look at creatures like the frog and the Bedouin spiny tail lizard, they actually use positive pressure ventilation. They suck air into their cheeks, squeeze those cheeks, and that actually inflates the lungs. And what's more amazing, if you look at the way they do that and how much volume they put in, they use exactly the volume that we now know in human adults is safe to use. Six mils per kilo, six to eight mils per kilo per breath. We've only known that for the last 20 years, but this is the volume that frogs and some lizards like the Bedouin uh, spiny tail lizard actually use is six mils per kilo. What's more, they actually breathe in quite a strange pattern. They sometimes breathe in, <gasps> hold their breath at the top, 
and then breathe in and out rapidly at the top <laughs> and then breathe out. And that's familiar to people in intensive care because this is the mode of ventilation which we have been using over the last six months in COVID disease. It's called APRV, Advanced Pressure Release Ventilation, and it can help people with very low oxygen saturations. What's more, you actually use this mode of ventilation. You may have even used it, hopefully, during this talk. You would have definitely used it if you've read Adam Kay's amazing book, This Is Gonna Hurt. You may even use it if you do buy my book, Critical, uh, available from all good bookshops on Amazon, on sale right now. Because this is the mode of ventilation people use when they laugh or when they cry. You breathe in and at the top, you breathe in and out rapidly, whether it's a cry or a laugh. Now, I'm talking to you from a place in Wales, which is near where this boat set sail for. Uh, this was Captain Scott's voyage in, in 1914, the Antarctic, to find and discover amazing things. And he set sail on this boat just around the headland that I can see out the window in South Wales, uh, known as Penarth. And some of the creatures that they found on this voyage, which was scientific as well as discovery voyage, were amazing. In fact, one of the creatures they found was something that we thought we may need to use in Nathan. This is the ice fish. It's found at the bottom of the Antarctic sea shelf in super cold water. And what's amazing about it is although it has the gene for hemoglobin, it doesn't make any hemoglobin. And that's because the oxygen inside the ice fish, it's super cold, it's under a huge amount of pressure at the bottom of the sea, and so the ice fish uses dissolved oxygen content to supply its tissues. Because oxygen dissolves well in cold, pressurized liquids, which is why your can of Coke or your cold beer tastes better when it's cold. It's under pressure, it's cold, the CO2 goes into solution. And we are now using creatures like the ice fish to inspire a new generation of treatments of things such as oxygen substitute carriers or blood substitute, often using pluriferrocarbons, for example, for this. But thankfully, Nathan didn't need this treatment. He got better with the knowledge we've applied, with the caring nursing staff at his bedside, and he got through it. But there's a message here that biomimicry and looking at how other non-human species manage critical illness is important. I met up with this chap, the super vet, Noah Fitzpatrick, at his practice in the UK, and looked at whether we can apply some of the lessons being learned in veterinary medicine to people at the brink of life. I want to leave you with a message from Nathan, and the sound is a bit difficult in this video, but Nathan says he's doing very well, he's been home for weekends, he got through it, and he says, bye guys, have a nice meeting. So next time we see this in the intensive care unit, which is somebody critically ill, rather than thinking of this as a complex series of devices, mechanical machines and drugs, actually we should see it more like this, like the African savanna with Mount Kenya in the background. Because actually all of that technology, all of those theories, a lot of those drugs, a lot of those machines can be taught to us if we just look at the non-human species around us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. It was an amazing presentation. I hope that all our participants also enjoyed it as, as much as I did. Uh, I really found it very interesting, your comparison between all these devices that some people think are so uh, complex, difficult. And then when we look at the nature, those are the simple things that nature has, right? So I would like you to comment a little bit more about it. Like, how did you really thought about this idea of looking at the devices and seeing the other species? Yeah, well, the, the truth is I was set a project uh, when I was training in anesthesia and in anesthetics, and that's a, a very practical physiology-based specialty of medicine, really. And the project was simple. Uh, we'd watched a load of birds fly past our operating theatre where I was working, 
and the consultant I was with uh, said, uh, we, and we were looking after a patient who was critically ill who had aspirated on their food. So in other words, their food had gone down the windpipe rather than the stomach pipe. And as we watched this flock of birds uh, fly past, he said, why don't these birds aspirate flies as they are flying? Why don't they die of respiratory failure like the person we are looking after? And I, I didn't have an answer for that, actually. Um, so I bought a, a book on animal physiology. In fact, it's here. It's on my shelf now. Uh, I'd recommend, if anybody's interested in this topic, this is a fantastic book, uh, which probably projects backwards, but it's Animal Physiology by uh, Schnatt Schmidt Nielsen, who is the father of comparative uh, animal physiology. And it went through why birds don't aspirate. And they've got a coaxial breathing system, which means air can go in as well as out. And that sent me on a little journey. I read through that animal physiology book and kept my eyes out for any interesting articles on this specialty, which is now known as biomimicry. That's actually very interesting. And it actually leads me to another question. Uh, as I am a neuroscientist and a PhD student now, I've been working with animal models for the whole my scientific career. And there is a lot of, um, let's say, discussions about using animals or not. So in your opinion, is it good for us? I mean, not good, but is it okay for us to use animals and to try to understand human diseases and find new technologies, new um, medicine using the animals? Yeah, great question. In, in fact, this is the topic of my next book is about animal physiology and human medicine. So I've spent the last couple of months talking to researchers about questions like this. And in fact, last month I spoke to a chap called Peter Singer, who's an animal ethicist in the University of Melbourne. He wrote a very famous book back in the 70s called Animal Liberation, which is a reason for uh, becoming a vegetarian, really. That was the thrust of his argument. But he's a very logical utilitarianism um, philosopher. So he's a very logical guy. And this is all based mainly on the concepts uh, of animal suffering. So I've actually transitioned since research in this book to be in 99% uh, vegetarian, uh, pretty much. You know, if I go to somebody's house and they've cooked cooked something uh, which is meat, I'll eat it. You know, I'm not as strict in terms of virtue as that. But I think that doesn't necessarily mean that every single form of experiment done on an animal ever is is particularly wrong it's less than ideal and you know if there were an alternative model i think that should always be used ethically morally everything else um, but there may be scenarios where that could be justifiable uh, in terms of ethics and morals and, and peter singer is the expert on this so you know re read his books um, rather than me in fact i did uh, a degree in medical law and ethics as part of training in medicine and wrote a dissertation called The Vegetarian Vivisectionist. You know, what are the ethics of being a vegetarian and yet relying on non-human animal models? I think the science of it is, is interesting too. You know, we know the animals used in captivity for experiments are often very poor models, very poor surrogates. The black six mouse, for example, which is used, you know, almost exclusively in many rodent experiments, doesn't react even like its normal wild counterparts. It's got a tolerance for pain and opioids, very different. It's bred in captivity, doesn't have the immune system like its counterparts. In Britain, we had a, a, a big problem with a drug trial in a place called Northwood Park, which was testing a, a new monoclonal antibody in humans. And that led to nine people becoming critically ill, partially because the models used uh, didn't have T memory cells or T regs um, because of the way, again, they're bred in sterile surroundings. So, you know, I think there's massive issues with animal models in, in research, um, morally and scientifically, but you know, there is a place for them at the minute in some, in some corners. But the alternative, I think, would always be better uh, if, if there were better models available. 
Yeah, I totally agree with you. Even though, as I tell you, I work with animal models, I believe that if there will be a model that could substitute them, we will definitely go for them. And of course, the laws that are now being applied, all the ethics committees, they're so strict that I, I can assure you that no, no animals are being hurt just because. We are really very careful. That's my uh, scientific perspective. I just really like to share that with others because I believe that some people don't understand the whole scientific background of this. And they, they are just very aggressive about it, when, especially when we scientists talk about it. So we also have to stand for us, right? Yeah. Um, but once again, I really enjoyed your talk and now I understand why are you nominated for this prize? Because even today I was starting watching the, um, uh, the new movie, uh, in Netflix <laughs> and it, it started very amazingly, like in this comparison between humans and animals, and you did the same thing with devices and animals. So it, it was just great. As you can see, our participants are not really engaging in having questions, uh, but I believe that now they have your Twitter and you will maybe get some messages. And of course, it was a big pleasure to have you with us. And I wish you all the best. And of course, lots of health in this situation. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, look forward to uh, listening in myself in the future. Take care. Yes. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye.